mammals. Yay for mammals. So cycle five and cycle six, we get to talk all about the marine mammals. There are four characteristics that you have to have to be placed in class mammalia. Okay, the first characteristic that you have to have is you have to have these things called mammary glands. Okay, and those mammary glands are used to produce milk to nourish offspring, nourish babies. Mammals tend to be a little bit better at taking care of their young. Um, some types of mammals will take care of their offspring for two, three years after they're born um, and like raise them. In fact, like killer whale pods are actually familial groups. So babies will actually stay with their moms for pretty much their like entire life. If they're female, they will stay with their mom for their entire life. The males will go off and kind of move around. But um, so they, they're good at taking care of their young. And they one of the ways that they do that is they produce milk to feed their babies. All right? So with the mammary glands. They also, at some point in their life, will have hair or fur that they will use for warmth. Um, and I mean, you may think like, OK, you see, it, see a sea otter, it clearly has fur, right? But if you think of like a dolphin, a dolphin doesn't really have fur or hair, right? It's pretty smooth. Um, they, so they do have some hair at some point in their life. When they're little babies inside their mom's body, they may have like a few whiskery hairs and then those disappear, okay? Um, but they do have hair at some point in their life. A humpback whale, if you know like the bumps on the face of a humpback whale, those are actually the hair follicles of a humpback whale. So they don't, they don't actually have like little hairs sticking out of there, but it is the hair follicle. Um, they're also viviparous, okay? So they will give birth to live young. In fact, the females actually produce an entirely new organ when they're pregnant called the placenta, and that placenta is the job of the placenta is to support and nourish the baby, okay? And then they give birth to live young. Um, and then they are endothermic. So they are able to maintain their body temperature despite the surrounding water temperatures. So they can live in colder waters, in colder areas than like reptiles can, because they can maintain their body temperature. Okay? So those are the four characteristics that they have to have in order to be considered a mammal. And then here's a picture of elephant seals if they're mammals. So, elephant seals. We're going to talk about four uh, orders of mammals. So we have carnivora, which are going to be sea otters and polar bears. We have pinnipedia, which are, which are seals, sea lions, seals and sea lions. Um, and then you've got sirenia, which are manatees and dugongs. And then you've got cetacea, which are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Okay. Um, here's just a couple pictures to help you see. These are mani this is the manatee on the left, and then you've got your orcas on the right, which are cetaceans. Okay, so the first order we're going to talk about is carnivora. Um, these are sea otters and polar bears. So sea otters and polar bears. Sea otters are found, or historically were found everywhere from Alaska, even over by Japan and Russia, all the way down our coast, all the way down to northern Baja, California. So they used to have a very, very far reaching range. Um, but sea otters have very nice fur, um, and so they were hunted almost to extinction. So um, now, the main population of sea otters that we have is mostly in Alaska, um, but you do have some populations that are in like Monterey Bay area, um, and those populations are growing, which is good. You very rarely see any sort of sea otter below or south of Point Conception. Okay, Point Conception um, is like the little piece of land that sticks out that Santa Barbara sits on. Okay, so you don't really ever see sea otters where we are, right? Um, and actually, there's there was an act enacted by Congress that if you do get a sea otter that comes south of Point Conception, they capture it and then they move it back up north. So this used to be like historically, it used to be in the range of sea otters and they would, we would have had sea otters off our coast and all of our kelp forests and it would have been great. But because um, sea otters eat a lot of the same things that fishermen fish for, one of the ways to kind of prevent um, fishermen from losing a lot of their livelihood um, and sea otters from losing their lives to fishermen, it was to kind of say, okay, like we'll reserve this spot for fishing. So down south of 
point conception and then above there then the otters rule all right so they um, they do keep them separate so we don't really see sadly the otters around where we are but they are cute they're very cute okay so these pictures show you where they used to be found so in yellow here on the picture on the left that's everywhere that they used to be found um, so over here by Japan and Russia and then all by Alaska Canada down the coast um, the red dots on this picture are the, the populations that survived the hunting, okay? So you can see there's only a few places where we still had sea otters left. They, they almost were wiped out, okay? Um, on the right, in green, that's the way we currently have sea otters. So again, all around Alaska, that's the main place that you'll find them. Again, a little bit over by Russia and Japan. Um, and then these orange dots, are the places um, where we've su successfully translocated some sea otters. So we've kind of like taken a few of them out of one population up here and we're like, okay, so we need you to spread. So we're gonna bring you down here into Washington and we're gonna, we're gonna put you here. And so they, they've moved some sea otters to try and like, you know, start new populations of sea otters and help them to increase and come back from near extinction. So um, it's going well, they're coming back, that's good. Um, and then you can see the little green spot by Monterey Bay as well. That's where they live. So their habitat that they will live in on the coast is mostly kelp forest. Okay. So if it's near the coast, it'll be kelp forest. Um, or it'll be ice flows up in Alaska. Where that's where they'll live. So you can see them in the picture on the left in the kelp forest, and then on the right resting on some ice. It is a lot of water. They're super cute and like people think that, oh, you know, you can cuddle with sea otters. They're so adorable. They're adorable, but they're actually in the weasel family and weasels can be kind of nasty. Um, and so they, they're in the weasel family, bless you. Um, and they also um, have sharp teeth and strong jaws, so they could bite you. So, I mean, they're super cute, but don't try and cuddle with the otters. <laughs> All right. So sea otters live in water, um, in the ocean, and they actually spend most of their life in the ocean. They very rarely, if ever, come up onto land. Um, and so they're going to spend most of their life in the ocean. And water is a very good conductor of heat, which means it's going to um, take heat away from their body very quickly. Um, so, and it does that much quicker than air does, right? So if you had like zero degrees Celsius air versus zero degrees Celsius water, and you were in zero degrees Celsius air, and, and then you went into water, you would get colder much faster in the water, right? Because the water is a good conductor of heat and it sucks that heat away from your body very quickly. Have you ever like dove into super cold water and it's just like, <gasps> you know, it like takes your breath away? You get cold very fast in cold water. So um, that water sucks away heat. The way that they stay warm, because they have to maintain their, their body temperature, the way that they used to stay warm is their fur. Okay, so they have super, super thick fur, the reason why they were hunted. Um, they have approximately a million hairs per square inch. Okay, put that into comparison, you have maybe 10,000 hairs on your entire head. Okay, so they have like 100 times more than that in one square inch on their their body. That's crazy. It's very, very, very thick fur. So because of that super thick fur, they were hunted because it's very warm and so people wanted it for like coats and for, you know, like the muffs that they used to wear and like hats and stuff like that. So um, they were hunted. The way that their fur actually works um, is like this. So here's their skin. Okay, um, This would be their skin right here. Uh, and then they've got like a bunch of these like shorter like under fur, and then they've got longer like guard hair, okay? Um, and so what happens is when they get in the water, these guard hairs lay down over the top of these under fur or under hair um, and trap air down here in this, these little fur hairs underneath here, okay? Um, and so what they do is they trap this air and because air is not as good of a conductor of heat as water is, 
um, and their fur is so thick, it actually prevents the water from reaching down to their skin. So they get a layer of insulating air around them, um, which keeps them warmer than if the water actually touched their skin. Um, and so if you saw at the aquarium, they actually had like a piece of sea otter fur that you could have touched. Um, and then if you watch the sea otter show, um, as they dive in, you see like the bubbles that go behind them. Um, that's from like this happening. And then as they swim, if, if some of it gets compressed, then air bubbles escape. You'll also see um, sea otters taking really good care of their fur because it is their only way to stay warm. Um, and so you'll see sea otters resting like on the surface of the water and they'll put like their arms and stuff like up to their up to their mouths. And what they do is they like blow air into there to like and like then like comb their fur. And so they do that to like dry that fur out and make sure that it's nice and fluffy and it keeps them warm. All right. So on the left, you can see that nice clean otter. You can see like the fluffy fur of the sea otter um, when it's dry. Um, and then on the right is what happens in an oil spill. So in an oil spill, what happens is that oil coats the fur of the sea otters and clumps it together. And so it can't do that thing where it like lays down and traps air. And so you get water that gets to the skin of the sea otter and it gets hypothermia and it dies from hypothermia. So that's why like oil spills and particularly like the big one that happened before I was born up in um, up in Alaska killed a lot of otters because of hypothermia because it matted down their fur. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's sad. So that's what it looks like. What they eat, they're going to eat lots of different things. They're going to eat fish. They like fish. But they're also going to eat all sorts of different kinds of invertebrates. So they're going to eat like crabs, urchin, lobster, clams, abalone, all sorts of different things in the water. They eat a lot. So their fur is the only thing that they have to stay warm. And then they're going to use um, their metabolism to produce heat to stay warm. Um, and because they do live in such cold environments, they have a fast metabolism to produce enough heat, which means that they need to eat a lot of food okay, to have enough energy to do that metabolism. Um, and so sea otters will eat about a quarter of their weight every day. So if you imagine having like a 100 pound sea otter, uh, they would have to eat 25 pounds of food a day just to maintain their weight and stay warm. Okay, So they have to eat a lot. Can you imagine like if you're 100 pounds having to eat 25 pounds of food a day just to maintain your weight. It's a lot. It's a lot. OK, so they eat a lot. Um, here's pictures of sea otters eating different things. You'll also see sometimes sea otters will, if they get like a clam or something like that, something that has a hard outer r shell, they'll pick up a rock as well. And then when they come up to the surface, they rest on their back and they put like their thing that they caught on their stomach and they hit it like with the rock. So they use like a little tool to like break through the shell to get to the inside. I know, they're so cute. They, yeah, they'll actually roll themselves up in kelp and like so that they don't float away and, and stuff. Um, so because sea, uh, sea otters eat so much food, they are actually considered to be uh, this thing called a keystone species in the kelp forest. And a keystone species, I know it's kind of hard to read, but it says a keystone species has a much larger impact on the environment than would be expected based on the number of individuals present. Okay, So because sea otters eat so much, just a few of them in the kelp forest ecosystem can have a huge impact on population sizes of their prey because they eat so much. All right. So because of that, there's only a few of them, but they have a huge impact, so they're called a keystone species. And um, when we talk about like the intertidal zone, sea stars are actually keystone species. So there's other things that can be keystone species in other ecosystems as well. So sea, sea otters are keystone species in the kelp forest habitat. 
Um, and they actually prevent, as long as they're present, the sea otters prevent the um, kelp forest from switching to what's called an alternative stable state. Okay? And an alternative stable state is another state that the kelp forest can exist in that will stay that way. So it'll stay as this alternative stable state unless something changes. Okay? So what, the, what it's called is an urchin barren. So you have a kelp forest that will remain as a kelp forest unless something changes. If something changes, it can switch and become this alternative stable state, which is called an urchin barren. And it'll stay as that urchin barren until something changes. Okay? And it can switch back to the kelp forest. All right, so the alternative stable state is something that that ecosystem can exist as, um, and it will stay that way unless something changes. Make sense? Okay, so let's look at how you can actually switch back and forth between a kelp forest and an urchin barren. So a kelp forest is maintained by the presence of urchin predators. So urchins, if you remember from last semester, urchins really like to eat kelp. Kelp is their favorite food, so they they love it. So as long as you've got predators that keep the population of the urchins under control, the kelp forest remains. If something happens, like you take the predators away, so you take the sea otters out, you take the California sheep's head out, you take the lobster out, um, then the urchin population grows. And as the urchin population grows, they eat more and more and more of the kelp, and the kelp disappears. And you get what's called a urchin barren, where you have lots of urchins and no kelp. The other way that it can switch is if you add another food source. So if you add um, another type of algae in that urchins like to eat and can eat, then you've now got two sources of food for the urchins. The urchin population that can be supported can be larger. Um, and so it can switch to an urchin barren that way as well. And it'll stay as an urchin barren, okay, where um, as long as nothing changes. So as long as that food source is there, as long as there aren't any predators. It can switch back to a kelp forest if you reintroduce the predators of the urchin, or you take away that food source. Does that make sense? Okay, so it'll switch back and forth. So as, um, as the sea otter population grows, uh, some places that were switched to an urchin barren because of the lack of sea otters can switch back and become kelp forests again. So sea otters are important for healthy, healthy kelp forest ecosystems. Okay. Here's pictures so you can see the difference between a kelp forest and an urchin barren. Kelp forest on the top, so lots of kelp, fish, and all sorts of animals living in the kelp. Um, and then here's the urchin barren, right? So literally just like rocks and urchins. And the one piece of kelp that remains is like being eaten by urchins. So it's going to stay this way because there's so many urchins that if a little spore of a kelp like settles down and tries to start growing, the urchins are immediately going to eat it. So it stays as an urchin barren. But don't sea otters eat urchins? So th that's sea otters. Sea otters are surface seeds. Um, polar bears. Polar bears are found in the North Pole, in the Arctic. Where are, where are penguins found? South Pole, Antarctica. Okay. So um, polar bears and penguins are not friends. So polar bears live in the Arctic. Um, they will live on land. They will live on sea ice, and they can also swim. Okay. So they live on land for the time of year where the sea ice is melted. Um, and so they can be on land hunting things on land. Um, and so particularly up like in the Arctic Circle, like in Alaska or at the top in the northern parts of Canada, and you can have polar bears up there. When the ocean is frozen, when the Arctic Ocean is frozen and there's ice, then the polar bears will live on that sea ice. And if they need to, they can swim for like 100 miles. So they've got these big, broad, paddle-shaped feet that they can use to swim through the water. So because they can swim through the water, why we talk about them in marine biology, and they eat a lot of stuff from the ocean. Um, the way that they stay warm is with this thing called blubber. Okay. So blubber is fat. And 
blubber and fat are not um, very good conductors of heat. So just like air is not as good of a conductor of heat as water, fat is a very poor conductor of heat. So they actually have a lot of um, fat just underneath their skin in this layer of blubber that um, helps to keep them warm, helps to keep heat inside of their body. And as long as we have time, um, I'll show you. We'll get like a big bucket of ice water and I'll have you stick like your bare hand in there and then we'll put a glove on you and put Crisco on it, um, which is fat. And then you'll stick that in the water and you'll see just how well Crisco or fat insulates. Okay, so they have lots of fat. Um, polar bears can have four and a half inches of blubber underneath their skin. So just like imagine that much fat underneath your skin all over the place. That's how much, that's what they have. Yeah, that's also kind of their, um, well, it is their um, energy reserves. So during the winter, they'll, or before winter, they'll fatten up and they'll get, um, store up a lot of fat in that blubber, A, to stay warm, but then also um, as time goes on, if they can't find food, then they can use those fat stores for energy. All right, so it helps them to stay warm and it's their energy saver. Um, they also get help from their fur and from their skin to stay warm. So polar bear skin is actually black um, and its fur is actually transparent or clear, okay, which is crazy. Um, it looks white to us, right, because if you look at a polar bear, you don't like see through its fur and see the black skin underneath. It looks white because um, as the rays of light hit it, all of the visible spectrum, Roy D. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, um, all of those, those colors of light get reflected back to your eyes, okay, and when we see the color white, um, it's all of those colors coming back to your eyes. So when you look at your paper, all colors coming back. Um, and so their fur does that, where it like reflects all of the light back to your eyes. It scatters the light uh, like snow does, and it looks white. So, but if you actually were to like take it and look at it super closely, you'd see it's clear. It's also hollow. So their fur, your hair, if you were to take and like look at a piece of your hair, your hair is solid. Their fur is hollow. So um, they used to think that that was because um, they used like that hollow fur to capture like sunlight. So as it like came through, it kind of bounced back and forth through the hair and then made it down to the skin and then the skin absorbed the heat. Um, they now know that like polar bear fur actually doesn't really like transfer light very well. Um, so they think that like the keratin inside of there maybe will absorb the heat and transfer it to the black skin to help to absorb heat from the sun as well. All right. Um, let's see. They eat seals, walruses, beluga whales. They'll also scavenge for food. So if like a dead whale washes up on shore, they'll eat that. They're not going to eat fish. Okay, they're going to be interested in much more like fatty things like whales and seals and stuff. All right. So that's what they're going to eat. Um, so polar bears, the males can be huge. They can weigh up to 1,200 pounds or be larger than that. So they're actually the largest land carnivore. So the, and when they stand up, they can be nine feet tall. So they're going to be very large bears. Okay. Um, you can actually take and in like the Arctic Circle and stuff, you can go on like these buses and they'll take you to like tour around and see the polar bears. And those buses are actually going to be like, um, you're going to sit up really high and you're going to have lots of stuff that surrounds you so that you, um, like when the polar bear stands up, that it can't get to you. So, because they are big and their claws are going to be like two to three inches um, and they're going to be sharp. So they can, they can do some damage, kill you pretty fast. Um, females are going to be a little bit smaller, up to 650 pounds, and let's watch a video. <laughs> 